of research that has been done by Dr. Robert Spicer. And uh, we have with us Dr. Ritesh Arya, uh, who we know as a great man who has worked a lot in the field of uh, geology. And uh, today we see that uh, Dr. Saab has been working in the field of geology. And of course, uh, his efforts go a long way in making this uh, successful venture that is Cathay's Fossil Museum, which is coming up uh, in and around Kusoli. You see that in this venture, he has put his life and uh, this webinar has also been organized by members of Cathay's Fossil Museum and Research Center, which is coming at, at Jangiri, a small village in Kusoli, the seal of Indian Himalayas. Geologically, the museum is located on the debris concealing the Dakshai Savatha boundary, which signifies closure of Cathay Sea and evolution of terrestrial ecosystem. The museum is built from 20 million year old rocks of the solid sandstone, beautifully chiseled to give museum an aesthetic look. Water which we drink in the museum is from a bore well drilled into 40 million year old white quasi sandstone, which is martyr bed extending from Pakistan to Burma in the least. Cathay's museum will display diverse, well-preserved fossils of stomatolites, ediacara, silobites, mollusks, ammonites, etc. from Spiti Valley, fishes, whales, sharks, oysters, molluscan, foraminera from Subatu and Leh. Plant remains consisting of logs of trees, leaves, flowers, roots, etc from Kusoli and Dharamshala, and mammals from Shivalis, signifying gradual evolution of life on this planet, and all are part of the museum repository. So anyone visiting the museum will have a glimpse of how different fossils collected from different geological formations across the Himalayas can help to rebuild the entire paleo history of the various events which led to the evolution and birth of the Himalayas. That is, as we all know, was the ocean once upon a time separating India from Tibet and Eurasia. As the Indian plate moved northward, the Tethy Sea squeezed, and then the two plates collided. Then the Tethyan sediments were uplifted, forming the mighty Himalayas. Lots of research has been done in timing the collision of the two plates, leading to evolution and birth of the Tethyan Himalayas. But still, there is no consensus, and there are Himalayan opportunities for researchers to come up with a convincing model to time the collision and explain the birth of the Himalaya. Keeping this in mind, the organizing committee of Cathay's Fossil Museum and Research Center decided to host a series of lectures by veteran geologists who dedicated their lives to understanding this geomechanism. And today's lecture is one such lecture which will be addressed by Dr. Robert Spicer, who, as I have already told, is a great man in the field of geology. So Dr. Spicer, we welcome you to today's forum and we would like to hear from you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to, okay, you need to give me permission to share my screen. Uh, Dr. Alex, you could find me. Uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, you need to give me permission. Yeah, it's okay now. It's okay now. Thank you. Okay, you should see. Yeah, I'll go back now. You should see uh, the lead slide. Is that correct? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, this particular view that you can see here is, is looking towards India from the Tibetan plateau. And the mountain you see in front of you is Mount Shishapangma. And uh, I will come back to that a little bit later. So I'm going to tell you um, some stories um, of how we have in the last few years literally the last few years, uh, quantified uh, as best we can the evolution of 
the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalaya. Um, this is an ongoing story, and it, it's not something that I've done by myself. As you will appreciate, um, modern research involves teams of people. And in this case, uh, there is an extremely good team of people from Sichuanbana Tropical Botanical Garden, where I have a joint appointment, and a team of climate modelers at Bristol University. Um, and together we make up uh, a project called Umbrella, understanding monsoons and biodiversity relevant to landscapes and livelihoods in Asia. And this links directly into what you were saying about World Water Day, uh, because the Himalaya Tibet uh, orographic evidence edifice is often referred to as the water tower of Asia uh, for fairly obvious reasons. The glacial storage of water um, supplies um, life-giving uh, water to, oh, at least two billion people. And so it's highly significant. And understanding how that earth system works that maintains that water tower and in fact built the water tower in the first instance is what the project is all about. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the talk. We often hear or see the phrase the uplift of the Tibetan plateau and I'm going to say right now this is nonsense and the reason is Tibet did not rise as a single low relief, I, uh, that is to say flat entity. It did not rise at, as a plateau. So there can be no uplift of a plateau. Instead, as we will see, Tibet was built incrementally and in quite complex ways. Sometimes you'll also see the term Qinghai Tibetan plateau. And it's not just referring to the plateau, it refers also to the Himalaya lumping the Himalaya in with the Tibetan plateau from a geological perspective is also nonsense, as I will explain as we go along. So in the talk, I'm going to ex examine the structure and assembly of this Earth's third pole region. So as well as being a water tower of Asia, um, the Tibetan Himalaya edifice um, redirects uh, major streams of air that has effects right across the planet. And of course, being a high and relatively cold region at low latitudes, it also affects global climate. For this reason, it's called the third pole. And it's the highest, largest and youngest topographic feature on Earth. What we're going to do is we're going to look at isotope data and recently discovered fossils to try and quantify particularly the paleogene topography and climate of the third pole region, because as we now know, it was in the paleogene that most of that topography was formed. And then we're going to look at just how reliable those techniques that we've used to quantify the growth of the third pole really are. And we're going to do that by using a, 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 an extensional basin high in the Western Himalaya called the Zanda or Zada Basin as a test case. So what I want to do first is look at some of the, the older uh, Tibetan plateau growth models. One of the first ones that was proposed was um, proposed by the geophysicist uh, Philip England and, and Hausman in the 1980s. And being geophysicists, like most physicists, they want to reduce everything down to simple equations. And they treated Tibet like a piece of plastic that was being squeezed by India coming north against the resistance of the Eurasian continent. Um, and as this compression thickened the crust and the mantle lithosphere below, the mantle lithosphere projected down into the hot asthenosphere and over time melted away or was thermally eroded. And once the relatively cold and heavy mantle lithosphere was removed, that allowed the portion of the crust that represents Tibet to rise relatively rapidly upwards 
going from approximately three kilometers to five kilometers at about 10 million years ago. Well, the geologists objected to this and a paper by Taponier et al in 2001 said, look, you can't just treat Tibet like a piece of plastic. It's got lots of uh, deep rooted ge geological um, uh, structures within it that will affect the behavior of the crust as India moves northwards. And in the Taponier et al model, they envisage the southern part of the uh, Tibetan region rising first in the Eocene and then progressively rising in a, in a uh, northeasterly direction. So the youngest uplift was the, um, the, the northeastern uh, corner, as it were, of the plateau. They also pointed out extrusion uh, out to the east and southeast but they didn't say much about the Himalaya, but the implication was that the Himalaya were the first part of this system to rise. When people started looking at, at oxygen isotopes, they found that in Southern Tibet and Central Tibet, uh, the isotopes suggested quite high uh, elevations in the Eocene. And so this was taken to justify or validate the Taponier model. And this um, diagram here published in Nature uh, in an overview of the work by Rowley and Curry by Mulch and Chamberlain uh, suggested that the Himalaya um, was included in the southern part of what is now the Tibetan Plateau. And that rose, that whole system rose at about 40 million years. And like um, Phil England and, and Hausman, they ignored deep geological structures like the Yalong Sangpo Suture. So they regarded the Himalaya and Southern Tibet as a single entity, despite the fact that there is a big suture there. And more recently in 2014, Wang Shengshan and others took the isotope paleoaltimetry and uh, suggested a model whereby central Tibet was high, that is to say uh, 4.5 kilometers or thereabouts in the Paleogene, and that actually that the Himalaya was a growth that was added in the Neogene to the south, and the Hoxil Basin and all the land to the north of the plateau also rose in the Neogene. So we, we have a central proto-Tibetan core plateau in the Paleogene. Well, let's look at what we're actually talking about in very basic terms. We have to the west, the Karakoram Fault, providing a boundary to the Tibetan Plateau, to the north, the Alting Tar Fault, to the south, the Himalaya, and to the east, the Hengduan Mountains that ramp down into Yunnan. But if you look at this sort of uh, topographic map, of the region, you will see that there are in fact structures within the plateau itself, not only the Yalong Sangpo Suture relative lowland going here through here, but another lowland running through here and others to the north. And what these represent are ancient sutures, sutures where uh, tectonic plates, micro plates or terrains impacted Eurasia throughout the Mesozoic. And what we now know happened is that these series of terrains, all of which are derived from Gondwana, uh, began to impact Eurasia in the case of the Hoxil terrain in the Triassic. The Changtang terrain then arrived in the Jurassic. The Lhasa terrain arrived at the end of, or towards the end of the Jurassic and in the early Cretaceous, and subducted beneath the Changtang terrain, just as India today, which arrived at the beginning of the Cenozoic, is subducting beneath the Lhasa terrain. And each one of these collisions uh, formed a suture, and associated with each suture, we have uh, an uplift or buckling, a deformation of the crust. So here in this cross section produced by Cap and Decel in 2019, you can see the Lhasa terrain going beneath the Changtang terrain and the India um, plate going beneath the Lhasa terrain. Now, of course, all this, these collisions built this large 
topographic high, which has profound effects on uh, the direction of, of air parcel trajectories. So here we have westerlies that are deflected around the third pole. And what they do is that they tend to um, allow moist air in particular to come over East Asia, form an East Asia monsoon. And they um, also, although they interact with moist air coming from the Indian Ocean to form the South Asian monsoon, um, this large high uh, piece of, of crust heats up preferentially in the summer and drags and intensifies these um, winds coming from the ocean, bringing moisture that supplies the needs of humanity and in fact the whole biosphere across most of Asia. So the question for a long time is, um, what would happen if Tibet wasn't there in terms of monsoon systems? And how did Tibet get to be what it is? Because understanding that will help us understand how monsoon systems work and how resilient they're likely to be in the future under a global warming scenario. Well, let me jump now to what we think we know. Uh, we've dealt with some of the older models, but literally in the last five years, our views have changed significantly. So what we think happened now is the following. Here we have the Tangula Mountains, which were formed when the Lhasa terrain collided with the Changtang terrain. To the south of that, we have the Gangdesi uplands, which are like an Andean arc formed when the Neotethian plate uh, uh, that preceded the Indian continental plate subducted beneath Eurasia. So this is a volcanic arc forming a mountain range in the late Cretaceous. And between this Gangdesi highland and the Tangula highland, we have the remnant of the Mesotethis. And until about 110 million years ago, we have marine sediments being deposited in central Tibet. By the Middle Eocene, roughly 47 million years ago, this marine system has entirely disappeared and we have a lowland valley that is at an elevation of around 1.5 to 1.7 kilometers. It's approximately, this is a bit of a guesstimate, 200 kilometers wide. Um, it's narrower now because of the compression from India um, and, and so on. But we think back in the Middle Eocene that it was a wide, low valley. So this, this elevation here is about 1.5 kilometers to 1.7 kilometers, whereas the Gangdesi at around 4.5 kilometers, as are the Tangula Mountains. By, um, 13, uh, sorry, by 29 million years, this uh, lowland had risen to near the present elevation, which is around 4,500 meters. And by the Miocene, we have a near plateau, but the Himalaya are still not very high. Back in the Middle Eocene, the Himalaya are just at around one kilometer elevation, building against the southern flank of the Gangdesi. By 15 million years ago, the Himalaya are roughly the same elevation as the Gangdesi, in other words, 4.5 to 5 kilometers high. And of course, now the Himalaya have a mean elevation in excess of six kilometers with peaks going to eight kilometers, which far exceeds the, the, the Gangdesi, which are still at around 4.5 to five kilometers. Obviously there are peaks in there too. And the growth of the Himalaya effectively blocks a lot of moisture getting onto the plateau, which previously when the Himalaya were lower, uh, didn't form such a blockage. So even as late as the middle Miocene, we have warm temperate woodland uh, on the plateau as against the uh, semi-arid grasslands, which we see today. So the question you should be asking yourself is, how do we know that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a very brief tour of just a few of the plant fossil localities that we have across this region. 
Now, none of this work would have been possible without the, uh, the help of people in India, notably uh, people at BSIP and also in Calcutta. Uh, and between everybody, we've looked at a range of lowland uh, plant fossil localities in the Siwaliks, which we use as our sea level datum. Uh, assuming that these were not formed more than around 250 meters above ancient sea level. And we compare those with the kinds of fossil floras we have in central Tibet. And today we're just going to look at the Bangor and Lumpula basins. Um, there are many other basins that I could talk about, but it would take much too long. So first of all, we need to talk about how we actually measure surface heights in the past using paleoaltimeters. Well, I think everybody's probably aware that as you go up a mountainside, and this is a diagram that comes from something published in 1890 uh, from Arizona, as you go up a mountainside, the vegetation changes. And this is because temperature drops as you go high. But temperature drop is not uniform in the Northern hemisphere on a south facing slope, that drop in temperature with elevation is less per kilometer than it is on the north facing slope, on the shadow side, if you like, of the mountain. And so we ch see changes uh, that vary with changing elevation as we go up slope, changes in, in the vegetation. Well, this is due to what we call a thermal lapse rate. And there are many different kinds of thermal lapse rates. One of the common ones been used in the past is a free air or environmental lapse rate. And this is simply the change in temperature with elevation Z in a column of free air, non-convecting -con column of air. Um, and that gives you this environmental lapse rate, which on a global basis is approximately 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. This is all very well if you're an airline pilot, for example, it's quite useful but not if you want to use uh, geological proxies like fossil leaves or isotopes that are formed in lakes and soils uh, to derive elevations because they're not in a column of free air. They're on a land surface and a land surface lapse rate or terrestrial lapse rate is very different. It, for a start, in most cases, the rate of temperature decline is less than it is in a column of free air. And typically on a global basis, it's only 5.5 degrees Celsius today versus 6.5 for the free air lapse rate. Now, the problem uh, with all of this is of course, as we saw from the first diagram, that this 5.5 uh, is not to be taken uh, or, or used uniformly because on a south facing slope, it might be 4.5. And on a north facing slope in the Northern hemisphere, it may be 6.5. It varies with aspect. It also varies with elevation, as you saw uh, with the, 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 the first diagram. And it also varies with latitude. So this number here, which is very often used in the literature to convert paleo temperatures into elevations, is extremely unreliable. So here we have our diagram again, our first diagram showing the changes in rates from the two sides of the mountain system. Not only is, does the terrestrial lapse rate vary with aspect and location and elevation, uh, you can't really use modern environmental or terrestrial thermal lapse rates because the lapse rates depend on atmospheric composition. And we know this has changed through time, changes in, atmos in atmospheric CO2, changes in moisture in the atmosphere, depending on what the temperature of the atmosphere is, et cetera. So you can't use modern, these numbers here, to determine what's going on in the past. So, when a, temperature, when a lapse rate is normally measured, it's measured using a conventional, ordinary dry bulb thermometer. So we're all used to, to dry bulb thermometers, no problem. But um, last year, um, 
Alex Farnsworth, uh, who's part of our team and, and, and a number of us in the group, we decided to try and explore um, these spatial variations in lapse rates. And what you see in this diagram is a, a number of black dots and pink dots and orange dots and so on. And what these are, are dry bulb lapse rates, terrestrial lapse rates, um, as determined uh, in a climate model. Now, in this particular exercise, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see how good these thermal lapse rates are at predicting a particular topography which we have given to the model. So in this um, rather complicated diagram, you can see that there's a red star down here. And in a nutshell, the closer these points are to the red star, the better these particular lapse rates are at um, predicting the topography which we have prescribed within the model. So basically, you can see that all of these over here are really appallingly bad at trying to reproduce the topography in the model. And these are all either annual or summer or autumn or winter lapse rates, dry bulb lapse rates, absolutely useless. The, um, the annual, mean annual ones, which are the norm normal ones used, are the black ones. The green ones over here, they get closer to our reference star and they're spring dry bulb lapse rates. So there's some hope there. But if we use a wet bulb thermometer, and that's a, thermo a normal thermometer with a, a wet wick around it, the evaporation of water from the wick into the relatively dry air around the, the, the thermometer cools the bulb of the thermometer, and so the temperature is lower. So in unsaturated air, wet bulb temperatures are lower than dry bulb. When the air is saturated, they're, they're the same. And what you can see here is a whole cluster of open squares very close to the star. And these open squares are not only our annual, but also our seasonal wet bulb terrestrial lapse rates. And they are all very good. It doesn't matter what season you're in, they're very good at reproducing the topography in the model. And the reason for this is that as a parcel of air uh, traverses up and over a mountain, it rises, as it rises, it cools. And of course, the relative humidity changes, it tends to go higher. So temperature and humidity are intrinsically linked. Um, and, in a, and this is reflected in wet bulb temperatures. Now, how do we get wet bulb temperatures for the past? Well, if you can think about it, a leaf acts as a wet bulb temperature. It's constantly losing moisture to the atmosphere through evaporation or evapotranspiration. And so the leaf is cooler than the surrounding atmosphere is. So when we look at leaf traits using a multivariate statistical technique called CLAMP, and there is the website if you want to go know more about it, I don't have time to go into the technique right now, when you put these leaf traits into a clamp analysis, you find that there's a very strong correlation between leaf traits and wet bulb annual mean temperatures. And here is the regression line. So if we can go to a fossil assemblage and look at the traits that we see in the leaves in that assemblage and convert those traits to wet bulb temperatures, we have a method whereby we can accurately predict past surface height. We can also determine temperatures using isotopes. And in this case, we're going to look at clumped isotopes. Now, what is a clumped isotope? Well, basically a clumped isotope is in this particular context, it's the composition, isotopic composition of carbon dioxide, CO2, with a mass of 47 when it's released from a carbonate dissolved in phosphoric acid. And what you're looking at is the substitution of carbon 13 for carbon 12 and carbon uh, and oxygen 18 
for oxygen 16. And the amount in which these substitutions take place is directly temperature dependent. So if you can measure these isotopic ratios in a carbonate, you can use a, uh, a formula to get back to the formation temperature of that carbonate and you convert that carbon, uh, uh, that carbonate formation temperature into a wet bulb temperature using a thing called the Davies-Jones formulation. We can also measure elevation using conservation of energy principles. Now in this particular instance, as a parcel of air rises over a mountain range, its moist static energy is convert, conserved. Moist static energy is um, made up of moist enthalpy, which itself is a combination of temperature and moisture, and potential energy, which is the product of height times the gravitational constant. So basically, because we know G stays the same through time, um, and we know that overall the moist static energy uh, stays the same, if we increase the potential energy, then the moist enthalpy must go down. So if we can measure moist enthalpy at a low elevation, let's say sea level, and we can measure it at a high elevation, what we're trying to find, and subtract those two and divide them by acceleration due to gravity, we can get the height difference. And again, leaves, because moist enthalpy is a function of temperature and, and moisture, two things that uh, plants are very interested in, what we find is that leaves code extremely well for mean annual moist enthalpy. And there is the, the uh, uh, regression line for that. So again, we can derive moist enthalpy from fossil leaves. And lastly, another paleoaltimeter that's been used is isotope fractionation. And this is different to clumped isotopes because what we're talking about here is differential fractionation of heavy isotopes and light isotopes. So, so let's suppose we have um, moisture in a parcel of air and that um, moisture has a, the, the water is made up of um, both heavy and light isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen. When that moisture condenses in the parcel of air and falls out as rain, the heavy isotopes preferentially condense out first. So what we end up with is the rain is isotopically heavier than the, moisture, than the um, uh, air parcel that it left. So as an air parcel rises up uh, against the mountain slope and uh, rains out moisture, that air parcel becomes progressively isotopically lighter. And here is a, an isotopic lapse rate showing the change in isotopic composition with elevation. So if we can uh, capture the isotopic ratio of rainwater in a carrier material, sort of typically might be organic matter or it might be carbonate. And we can preserve that through time against all kinds of diagenetic changes and so on. And we know what the isotopic composition was at the start of that air parcel trajectory, sea level. Uh, then we can calculate the elevation of our carbonates uh, at height. The problem with this, though, is that as an air parcel travels over a topographically complex land surface, such as Tibet, there are multiple evaporation and precipitation events, all of which will change the isotopic ratios. Now, typically in, in isotope paleoaltimetry, uh, people use what Hoke's called educated guesses to compensate for this. But these days we can use um, isotope enabled climate models, which are far more rigorous. So let's examine what would happen in our, our Gangdizi Changtang Central Tibetan Valley system with um, a monsoon climate. In the summer, uh, we have wet air coming from the Neotethys uh, rising up against the Gangdizi because we haven't built the Himalaya yet. And we get progressive depletion of the heavy isotopes so that the air passing into the valley is enriched in light isotopes. 
in the winter, we get a reversal of the airflow. And so um, we get the same sort of thing happening over the Chiang Tang mountain range. Again, filtering our air parcel in favor of light isotopes. So whatever is ending up in the valley and going through, a, 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 a let's say, a, a water cycle within the valley will only have light isotopes. And the isotopic composition will reflect the crest heights of the two bounding mountain systems. And so it doesn't matter where you find your carbonates, let's suppose you find them in the lake down here in the middle of the valley, you will still get an elevation, which is that of the Gangdesi or the Changtang mountain crests. So inevitably you end up with a phantom uh, plateau. And we can test this in a climate model. Here is a climate model with a, a valley in Tibet, here's one with a plateau in Tibet. And if you look at the isotopic signatures, you can't really see any difference between the two. So this is why all the isotopes we get from central Tibet point to there being a plateau, a high plateau in the Paleogene. However, when we go to the central Tibetan plateau, and we start digging in Eocene sediments, we find fossils. And these fossils tell a very different story. So here we're going to the Bangor Basin along the Bangong New Jiang Sutra here in central Tibet. There's the Bangor Basin. And we have a series of plant fossil localities and their age is determined to be Middle Eocene using UPP dating. And this is the assemblage that we find. And amongst them, we find this, uh, what we call a rabbit ear kind of uh, seed that looks like a small diptrocarp. You can think of it in terms of a small diptrocarp, although we don't actually know what it is. But what we do know is that we find the Tibetan uh, form also in the North American Middle Eocene Green River Formation and the Middle Eocene Messel uh, deposits in Germany. So this particular plant, whatever it was, was widespread in the Northern Hemisphere in the Middle Eocene. Here are some other illustrations of some of the plant fossils that we get, including this Ilanthus, which is one of the very, very few uh, plant fossils that have an Indian connection. Most of the plant fossils are strictly non-Gondwanan in their uh, affinities. Well, we can look at the uh, Bangor Basin uh, leaf flora, and if we do a clamp analysis on it, we find it's monsoonal. It has a wet season, dry season precipitation ratio of around six to one, which is just monsoonal. It's weakly monsoonal. It's subtropical with a mean annual temperature of 19 degrees, warm month mean up near 30, with a cold month mean of seven, which suggests, given the uncertainties, that we may have had very rare but occasional frosts. And, uh, the, and it was quite humid. Uh, it, it's a lot of moisture in this uh, valley system. But the VPD, the seasonal VPDs, vapor pressure deficits, suggest a wet winter and a dry summer, quite unlike the modern South uh, um, Asian monsoon. But critically, when we use the moist enthalpy conservation of energy method for getting elevation, we find it was in an elevation of around 1.5 kilometers plus or minus 0.9, which is a long way um, uh, lower than the present elevation of nearly five kilometers. So we published in 2020 a paper in PNAS and referred to this as a Shangri-La Valley, uh, taking the inspiration from the Lost Horizon novel uh, published in the 1930s. And uh, what we see here is a reconstruction um, done by Alex Boersma, showing our central Tibetan valley with a, a little summer rain shower and uh, our highly diverse um, tropical uh, system. If we now move to the Lunpula uh, Basin, which is adjacent to Bangor, and start digging there, we find palm leaves. 
and we published a paper in Science Advances in uh, 2020. And at that time, we thought these palm leaves were 25 million years old, but we now know from new UPB dates uh, on, in the section that they are actually 38 million years old. And if we look at uh, yeah, a thermal lapse rate approach, uh, we can work out what the maximum elevation is of the valley that would allow palms to live. And we can do that because palms are temperature sensitive, particularly as seedlings. And we know that natural populations of palms cannot survive where the mean uh, cold month or the cold month mean temperature is below 5.2 degrees Celsius. And using a 38 million year old terrestrial lapse rate that we can obtain from our climate model, um, we end up with a, an elevation of 2.8 kilometers. So between, four points, uh, between 47 million years and 38 million years, the plants are suggesting an elevational rise of um, 1.5 kilometers to an elevation that is somewhere below 2.8. All we can derive from the, plant, the palm is a maximum possible elevation. When we look at the leaf flora as a whole for that same uh, locality, here's uh, Ilanthus again with our Indian connection. When we look at the leaf um, assemblage as a whole and use moist enthalpy, that gives us an elevation of 2.6 kilometers, which of course is below our 2.8 maximum given by the palm. So we can assume here that we get an elevational change of 1.5 to 2.6 between 47 and 38 million years ago in central Tibet. Along with the plants, we find things like water striders, which are typically low elevation, and this thing, which is called a climbing perch, which actually um, is a fish that breathes water, uh, between, sorry, breathes air, and as a consequence, cannot live in lake systems where the surface of the lake is frozen at any point in the year. What is also interesting is that these uh, leaves and insects and everything are all in oil shales. So actually the Lumpula and Bangor basins are potential oil producing areas where we have the high organic productivity in these lake systems in central Tibet converting now to hydrocarbons. We can also obtain temperatures using clumped isotopes from these same locations. And this is an example from the Lumpula Basin. Um, the assumption has been that the soil carbonates formed in the summer, but actually uh, this is not necessarily the, the case. All we need is a warm enough temperature for the chemistry to take place. But what's critical is that the soil has to be drying but not totally dry. So as the soil dries, the carbonates get precipitated. So what we've had to do here is, is we've again used our climate model to look at the soil moisture at the depth in the soil profile where the carbonates are normally sampled, which is around 40 centimeters in the paleosol. And so we can tell here that between April and October in the Lutetian, uh, middle Eocene, we have declining moisture content. So it, the soil is drying. So potentially we could form carbonates anywhere in this window. What we also need to look at is the precipitation evaporation ratio. And it's uh, we're only losing water critically at the surface between February and June. That restricts it a bit more. And from June onwards, we have a little bit of summer rain. And from October through to the end of December is when our wet season is. So this allows us to constrain part times of the year when the conditions are right for carbonate precipitation. So the temperatures we get from the carbonate are specific to these particular times in the year, not necessarily just the summer. In our model, we can produce all different kinds of topographic scenarios. So here we had a Lutetian valley. We can have a Lutetian plateau at 4.5 kilometers. 
we can go a little bit younger into the Chattian and have a valley and a plateau, and, and we can test our observed clumped isotopes against what the model is saying the temperature should be, um, and we find only a certain number of matches. And when we look at that, we find that the only conditions which allow us to give or have a model predicted climate that matches the isotope temperatures is when we have a Lutetian Valley and a Chattian Plateau. And the Lutetian Valley is at 1.7 kilometers in the, uh, for these samples between uh, 50 and 40 million years ago. And when we move to a plateau, the isotopes give us an elevation of four kilometers or above. Again, this pattern matches very well what we're getting from the leaves and shows that we have a, a, a significant rise of central Tibet between 40 million years. And by 29 million years, we have already established the plateau as I showed you in the cartoons earlier. So what we've got here is a summary of what we now believe to be the case uh, for the different parts of Tibetan Himalayan system being built at different times. So way back um, at the beginning of the Cenozoic, the Gangdesi are already high and they remain high all the way through to the present day. The next part of the uh, third pole to be built is the Hengduan Mountains and they rise between um, 50 and, and by 40 million years, they're pretty much in a, the sort of form that we have today. And when we look at molecular phylogeny, we find the earliest origins of alpine taxa um, occur in the Hengduan Mountains. So the molecular phylogeny and the geology are very similar. And we published that in Science last year. Uh, the next part of, of Tibetan system to uh, reach its modern elevations is central Tibet, as I've just gone through. Then we have northern Tibet rising to its present elevations. But the last part of the third pole to build are the Himalaya. And they, um, uh, all through the um, Paleogene, are relatively low, only achieving roughly two kilometers by 23 million years. But then they shoot up so that by 19 million years, they're already exceeding five kilometers. And of course, they continue up to today. So the building of the Tibetan uh, plateau was not a case of an uplift of a plateau, but it was the differential rise of lots of bits of the plateau at different times. But how do we know this paleoaltimetry is correct? Well, we have a particular um, basin, a very young basin called the Zander Basin here in, in the northwestern Himalaya. It sits just south of the Yalong Sangpo Sutra at a present elevation of around 4,250 meters. The deposits were um, accumulated in the Zander Basin in the late Miocene through to Pleistocene with some leaf fossil assemblages here at, in the Pliocene at 3.5. So we've got fossil horses and we have pollen also from different parts of this section. And the dating is all correlated across the, the basin using magnetostratigraphy. The fossil flora that we have there is mostly composed of small leaves, much as the present day vegetation is within the Zander Basin. Uh, these are all adapted to relatively cool and, and relatively dry environments. There are no conifers um, and there are no um, uh, large wind pollinated um, plants um, of any great abundance within the leaf flora. What we do, however, notice, just give you a, a context, is that when we look at the pollen flora, the pollen flora is dominated by wind pollinated taxa, in particular conifers like Picea, Pinus, Suga, etc., which we don't see in the, in the leaf fossils. And what we can do is we can use our dry bulb lapse rates and apply them to pollen or leaves, we can apply wet bulb lap rate, lapse rates, or we can use enthalpy and isotopes. 
So let's just look at this for the moment. The gr light green shading here represents the results that Wu et al. produced in 2014 using nearest living relative techniques, um, um, coexistence approach on fossil pollen. And what they got was a very low elevation. They said no higher than 3.6 kilometers for the Zander Basin three million years ago. Remember today, it's um, uh, over four kilometers. Now, the problem that they had with this is that they used, uh, they calibrated their pollen elevation using elevation zones uh, in Eastern Tibet. And although there are no conifers around in the Zander Basin today, and there are no conifers preserved in the Zander Basin uh, Pliocene leaf fossil assemblage, they assumed that the conifers were growing around the Zander Basin. What in fact is happening is the wind pollinated conifers, the pollen is being wafted up the southern flank of the Himalaya by the monsoon uh, north flowing winds carried over the Himalaya and dumped into the basin. So a lot of the tax that they find in the pollen flora represent uh, lower elevation vegetation growing on the windward side of the Himalaya, not what was growing around the basin itself. Um, if you apply a global mean uh, dry bulb lapse rates shown here by the red um, uh, um, circles to the leaf flora, you also get very low elevations. If you apply a model wet bulb lapse rate, but a dry bulb temperature obtained from the leaf flora, again, you get low elevations. Where you do get um, interesting results uh, that are very similar to the modern elevation is when you use clamp using either thermal lapse rates or uh, nearest living relative coexistence temperatures based on leaves. And Huang et al. in 2020 obtained these sorts of uh, um, elevations in the, the blue band here. The blue and green dots that you can see here are all elevations derived from wet bulb temperatures uh, of the Zander Basin and the lowland Siwalix and using a model derived wet bulb lapse rate. And there you get temperatures which are, uh, sorry, elevations which are very similar to the modern, which is more realistic given the young nature of the basin itself. When we look at the isotopes, we tend to get very high elevations um, as shown by the, the pink shading here, elevations above five kilometers. And remember what I said earlier on that the isotopic signature is the signature of the mountain crests that the air parcel has to pass over before the rain falls into the basin itself. So these isotope elevations are all biased towards the Himalayan crest and the Gandhisi crest rather than uh, the elevation of the basin floor itself. Interestingly, uh, moist enthalpy values are also in this same bracket. And we do not really understand why, because they should not. So we can discount the pollen analysis and the dry bulb approach. The wet bulb approach seems reasonable and the um, isotopes seem to be giving us crest heights, which is fine. And if we use these together, we can get some idea of the ancient uh, relief. Uh, but when it comes to the moist enthalpy, that's a bit puzzling. Now, when you use moist enthalpy in a model, and here is, uh, you can see here, um, this is mean sea level um, moist enthalpy minus the, uh, the uh, topographic height moist enthalpy, and we put a valley in Tibet, we can see that valley. And when we make Tibet a plateau, we can see that plateau. So we know that moist enthalpy is tracking uh, uh, to paleo topography extremely well, much better than isotopes do. But what I decided to do during our COVID lockdown in the UK was to look at a series of, of Google Earth transects going from lowland Siwalik sites all the way up to the Himalayan crest, typically uh, around five kilometers, 
which is the sort of range we're talking about here. And uh, looking at gridded moist enthalpy values for each one of these sites and gridded moist enthalpy values for elevation, dividing those differences by little g. And what we find is that uniformly, this approach to as, um, measuring elevation overestimates the observed height. So here are the observed heights at the, each one of these locations, height difference between the Siwalik and the, the mountain crests. They're all uh, between four and, and just over five kilometers. But our um, moist enthalpy derived elevations are roughly one kilometer higher all the way through. So there is a systematic over um, estimation of, e of elevation using this approach. And we need to do a lot more climate um, modeling work to try and understand why. And very lastly, I want to take you to um, uh, some very recent work being done on Mount Shishupangma. I introduced you to this earlier on. And uh, back in, in 1973, uh, Zhu et al. Uh, reported some Quercus semicarpifolia, some oak leaves, at an elevation above 5,000 meters on the 8,000 meter high Mount Sheshapangma. But Zhu et al. didn't know exactly where they came from. They were just found as loose blocks and they had no idea of age. They assumed they were Pliocene. And this led to a lot of stuff in the Chinese literature about. Tibet rising suddenly in the Pliocene, which is complete nonsense. But um, last year, uh, my colleagues at Sichuanbana decided to go back onto Mount uh, Shishapangma and below, just below 6,000 meters, they discovered uh, these oak leaves. And we now know from very recent dating that they cannot be older than 16 million years. So they're middle Miocene or younger, but we still don't know the exact date yet until we get more dating results back. So there is still a lot more to do in the Himalaya in terms of tracking its uplift and plant fossils are a possible, possible way of doing that. Some takeaway thoughts. Plant fossils, isotopes and climate modeling are changing our ideas of Tibetan landscape evolution. This evolution, we now know, was complicated. And this reveals deep geological processes that include not just crustal thickening, but also in places, thermal delamination. Uh, it's just that the thermal delamination doesn't apply across the whole plateau uniformly. This complexity with the Paleogean Central Valley has got to be incorporated into any realistic climate modeling, including modeling of the evolution of monsoon systems in Asia. Model data iteration uh, does and can lead to much better understanding of monsoon dynamics through time, but we have to get the elevations correct we then put those elevations into a model. We then refine our lapse rates and iteratively, we can get to a much better solution for the unique growth dynamics of the plateau region and the Himalaya. Isotope and fossil-based paleo paleoaltimetric proxies are complementary. Isotopes tend to give you the highs, fossil-based paleoaltimeters give you the, the valley bottoms. Isotope fractionations um, are biased towards the mountain crests, but in a valley system like we had in central Tibet, that can give you a false or phantom plateau. And fossil pollen paleoaltimetric proxies are really highly problematic due to the fact that pollen can be transported upslope, downslope, reworked, etc., and you have no idea where it came from. Uh, and so I would, I would argue that pollen-based paleoaltimetric estimates are extremely unreliable. However, fossil leaf proxies, and because fossil leaves can't be transported far from where they were growing and still remain in a recognizable state, combined with wet bulb lapse rates, do give you, appear to give you very reliable outcomes. Uh, and of course, moist enthalpy is a possibility as well. 
So a big thank you to everyone on the team, including all those lovely people in Tibet who helped us over the years. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, Dr. Arya, uh, if you think like saying anything about today's presentation by uh, Dr. Robert Spicer, of course, it was an extensive one and very wonderfully given. Uh, along with all the details and the data that are required for such a uh, wonderful presentation. So Senzuic evolution of Himalayas and the landscape, of course, very well uh, described by Dr. Robert Spicer. And uh, of course, that is, is beholden. We, we are thankful to you for this wonderful presentation. Dr. Arya, what would you say? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Spicer. It has been wonderful listening to you. Uh, I, I must appreciate your work, which you have done in, in the Tibetan Himalayas, the Tibetan part. The way you have shown your first few slides are very interesting, you know. The progression from Cretaceous, Eocene, Oligocene, Pliocene, the entire sequence as it goes northwards, you know, various models which you have shown, can you just... Uh, uh, show the first few slides. Yeah, I, I can. I, I can go back. Yeah, maybe. So, so the these uh, uh, so these reminds me of uh, you know I had been working in, on fossils for now almost like thirty five years collecting fossils. Not so. No, no. Maybe maybe earlier earlier slides also. Earlier ones. Earlier ones. Yeah, yeah. So maybe because that is basically the progression which uh, you have shown is from the north of the Ladakh Bathlet, you know, or maybe I, I should say the Kyang Ta Thang region, you know. So, so these, uh, you no, know, maybe uh, the formation of the model earlier all uh, earlier slides, you know. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This one, this one, this one, good enough. Okay. Maybe this one or the, the other one, you know. Yeah. No, uh, maybe earlier one. So that earlier one still. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. These are good enough. So now you see the Himalayas. They have not shown much, but uh, but but the but across the uh, in the Sangpo Sutra zone, the Eocene Tibet. Then we have the Oligocene Tibet and the Quaternary Tibet. Very well demarcated. Uh, and uh, I must say that when we were working in uh, Ladakh. Then south of Ladakh Batalith, we see the almost reverse sequence here, you know. On the southern part of the Sucha zone, we find the Eocene uh, sequence, which is almost equivalent to Sabatus. And we got a lot of uh, oysters, we got a lot of mollusks in Neoma formation, and also in Kargil, which were equivalent to Sabatu and uh, Kasali formations. And a similar type of progression we can see in the Indus in Molays, you know. So, if we see uh, 40 millions, 30 millions, 20 millions, and then this is Ladakh Batalith, then uh, in the Himalayan side, it will be like 40 million years, 30 million years, 20 million years so south of it. So in the smallest sequence is almost like, uh, so this, uh, 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 almost uh, here, you know, in Ladakh part. And uh, this uh, this is quite interesting, you know, the Ladakh Batalith, how it played an important yeah. role in uh, delimiting, delimiting the two basins. And the flora and fauna, which we see that you have shown that most of the flora is uh, uh, has, has affinities to uh, uh, northern northern hemisphere, or maybe the northern um, North American part, or maybe northern land of the Tibet. But in uh, in in the Himalayan part, we get uh, I, if I talk about Kasali, as we have already discussed. Uh, so in Kasali, uh, I have been working for the last, uh, maybe so uh, since 1987, and uh, you visited that place in 1991 or 92 when you visited Kasali. We have been collecting fossils, but, uh, but, but the remarkable thing about those fossils was that uh, about six, seven species which we got, the megafloral species I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the pollens. Pollens earlier used to give that uh, feeling of, uh, uh, you can say, very in, uh, uh, near coastal environment, but again, as you rightly said, that uh, pollens cannot be relied upon, you know, for uh, any altimetric. Uh, so, in, 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 in,
yeah, yeah, I mean, there are there are some exceptions. Um, yeah. If you, for example, go to the Siwalix and you find a lot of pollen that are at mangrove, for example, then uh, or or even better still, mega fossils, then that is very useful for saying there is a strong indication that this we are near sea level. Yeah. But when it comes to mountain crests and and um, uh, prevailing wind directions and so on, then upslope and downslope. Uh, movement of pollen means that you get a very blurry picture of the of the elevation of the source material. Yep. Um, but you you were you were saying in the you know the western uh, Himalaya part and Ladakh and, and etc. One of the major questions that we that are st that is still unresolved is when did we get the loss of the ocean? between the Indian continent and Eurasia, um, the last little marine puddles, as it were, uh, it was a middle uh, uh, 50 million years, 55 million years, this kind of thing in the central um, uh, region around here. What is very interesting is the diversity of views on which part of India collided first. Was it on the western side? Was it on the eastern side? On the western side, you have the um, Ladakh Kohistan arc included in this system. And uh, we need a lot more work being done uh, to try and get um, a very a much clearer idea of the collision dynamics. Because if we're going to use things like isotopes to try and understand the elevation, we need to know what the, 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 the isotopic composition was of the air parcel when it started its rise. And if we've got an open seaway through here, we know again from modeling that the, the isotopic composition of the ocean there is going to be very, very different to if we have little isolated marine embayments and stuff along there, or if we actually have forest down here. It's, it's really um, a big question. And uh, we need a lot more work done along uh, the, the Siwalix, the Himalayan front, up into the Himalaya. Obviously, there are issues about access to some parts of the high Himalaya being close to the international border uh, and also um, over here. But the more work that is being done, to retrieve fossils and isotopes from this system, the better uh, our sort of ability to reconstruct the past landscape and understand monsoon evolution becomes. Yeah. So I was just talking about my solid collection. So we got about uh, six, seven mega plural species. 18, 1894, Medley had uh, discovered few, uh, the palm leaves. And after that, uh, the species which we have discovered, as uh, uh, I have already told you, that there were about uh, six species, Garcinia, Gluta, Combatum, and Cyzesium species. Today, they are nowhere found in Himalayas, and they are, they are confined to Indo-Malayan region. So they are confined to Andamanikabar. They are confined to Malaysia or Indonesia. And uh, these fossil flora, if you are finding those in Kasolis, and Kasolis are almost equivalent to Ladakh, uh, maybe homotextual basins, then probably at the time of deposition of these sediments based on plant fossils, we proposed a model that these were deposited near the equator at the time. So 20 million years, the Kasoli sediments were deposited near the equator. And uh, the Ladakh extension was unfolded and uh, going towards Chitravata and uh, towards Pakistan. And mm -hmm. that type of uh, scenario and the Tethys Sea, which we call the Tethys Sea, was between between this Kasoli, uh, Savatu, Dakshai, Kasoli sediments near the equator and the sea further ahead of it, sandwiched between uh, the formations which we are showing, like about uh, this, the Eocene Tibet and uh, Oligocene Tibet. And, these were further north, you know, and mm. maybe they have nothing to do with the with the with with, the, with, with these formations, you know. They were developing independently, and uh, the Kosoli, the Shai, Sabatu, and the Ladakh 
Kargil, this entire Malaysia, Dharamshala, Udhampur, all they were depo uh, depositing near the equator. And this sea, which was, which we call Tethys, which is a confusion that the entire ocean, which maybe this was an ocean, but uh, this was between ocean between uh, so this type of modeling I, uh, is actually uh, uh, taking a lot of my time, and I'm I'm preparing proposing something like uh, uh, this Kasoli, Dakshai, Sabatu being uh, near the equator, and then when India moves, they were already there, you know. And yeah, they, yeah. this collision this collision happened between first collision happened between India, Indian plate and the and the Sabatu Dakshai sediments, and then this entire thing moved together from here and. Uh, they moved to, uh, further ahead, you know, and 20 million years, or maybe maybe this is 20 million years. But if shivaliks are also be to be taken here, uh, uh, then it, the time frames goes to about five million years, or maybe less. Then also that is there, this is near equator, but that that evidences we have to gather, and then this entire things moves further north. And mm. the, uh, the thing which you have shown about Tibetan Plateau they, that is, that was developing independently and uh, very rightly. We have no similarity with Indian flora, and they have more uh, similarity with the with, with the Eurasian, uh, with, with, with mm. the Europe or North American or maybe the northern part. Yeah. So that type of uh, equation now almost uh, uh, suits, you know. So the collision, you know, based on uh, maybe isotopes, someone has suggested isotopes or that they have suggested the collision to be taking place around 60 million years, someone 50 million years, 40 million years. Last they say about 30 million years. Million years, but no one goes beyond 20 million years, 28 million years. No, they assume everything is all over and done with by yeah, then. Yeah, so but 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 the fossil evidences say that still Kasoli sediments and Shivaliks may be very much near the equator, and this yeah, yeah. transition has to move, and then yeah. uh, then this transition has to move, you know, and this the entire uh, thing has to move further ahead, and then modeling of this type makes uh, the Himalayan story very interesting. And that has all that. This is the basis of my, uh, me getting interested in all this uh, uh, web, uh, Himalayan Tethys fossil museum, you know, because the model, when we want to place the fossils, the chronology doesn't work the way the models have been proposed earlier. Mm. So, so maybe uh, great thought has been given now. And uh, now, I what I want to propose is, is, is something like this, you know. And mm. with seeing your uh, this diagram, I think uh, with this picture, it, 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 it gives a very, very simplistic uh, uh, this Mulch and uh, Cambrian and Rowley and Curie. They have, I think, uh, and this all these models already have given a very, very simplistic view of how the Himalayan part could be in near future. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And maybe, maybe if we get, uh, yeah. yeah, we are trying to work with Gaurav. He is planning to come somewhere in. Uh, from BSIP, and he also, uh, you mentioned about clamp and all. He was, uh, he told me once that he's also interested in doing these clamp studies. Yeah, and, I think uh, Gaurav is, is there, I think, oh, listening. He's, he's, he's joined, you know. Okay. So, so he, 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 he wanted to do this for, from the fossils which we have collected from, uh, I have a huge collection of fossils from uh, uh, Kasoli, so he's, he's quite interested in um, uh, doing that clamp study, and but he wanted number of fossils. I don't know how much uh, because I have been transporting these fossils from one place to another, giving it to one museum to another, so that they could uh, actually display it in a in a in a in a fashion that plants become fossils become more popular and fossils become more popular. But nobody, no museum took up this uh, challenge. So we decided to make our own museum and then study and then uh, Gaurav mm. uh, and uh, uh, this BSIP team they are they are planning something. So maybe. With this type of modeling, which we have already done in the in the, in the, in the last uh, Tibetan part, we may come up with some joint ventures and then do some extensive work in uh, in the fossils which uh, we which we already know. From uh, we have been working with Dr. Rovasti Guleria and uh, Sh Sh Rashmi Shrivastava, Madam, for so many years, and a uh, lot of fossils have been reported. And then with this team of uh, young uh, paleobotanists from uh, ESIP. So maybe we come up with this type of modeling which we have already done in Tibet and just see how these uh, fossils, the plant fossils, tell a great story about the paleo latitudinal position and paleo altitudinal position also. So paleo latitude is very significant because in 1994 we have already published that these show great similarities. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Avasti was there and we did a lot of uh, 
uh, studies in uh, in FRI field research about uh, institutes in uh, Dehradun comparative studies of the bees, and uh, we concluded that these were very important. You know, so if now this uh, clam studies can be carried out with the help of um, BSIP, I think uh, we may get very interesting results. Yeah, well, I was saying what what I tell the Chinese colleagues is keep digging, because the, we need the fossils. The more, the better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Gaurav, you have anything to say? Uh, uh, I can say that uh, that you have said that Kasoli uh, was near the equator. So, um, which uh, tectonic model you are using to say this uh, that Kasoli was near the equator? Because I am using that Scottish, I am huh? using that Scottish model. Which you are using? What what uh, what the tectonic model you are using to say that Kasoli was near the equator? So I'm making that model. You know, you'll come to know very soon. You know, we are just we are just building that model now, on the basis of Actually, evidence which we got on the basis of the fossil evidence, not only plant fossils but also on the basis of oysters, bivalves, and. Uh, sediments which we are getting from the Sabatu and also in Ladakh, Neoma, uh, Kargil, whatever fossils which we have got. So we are trying to compare all these things and there have been published reports from Kalakot also about the EUC. Um, uh, uh, this. So the entire thing which we are trying to do is, is we are trying to work a model. We are, I'm not working on anybody's model. It is not like that. I am making a model which, uh, which, will, tell, which will tell this story based on the fossils which we have got for the last 30 years across the Himalayas. So maybe in near future, we are not working on anybody's model. Let me be very clear. We are making our own model. Our and model. that will be based on, yeah, yeah. So that is not based on any isotopic studies, but that will be based on the fossils and the lithological constraints, the lithostratigraphic constraints and the biostratigraphic constraints. That is what we are planning to work. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 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 do we have any questions? Uh, Oh, um, I don't. At the moment, I don't have any question because uh, I really missed the time and I joined uh, very in the no, last. No, so no problem. Uh, we will be uh, uh, sending you, uh, this on uh, YouTube, and if you have any questions, you are free to. Uh, you can sure. listen to that, and then maybe we can have a premiere of it, and uh, then we can ask uh, Robert Spicer to answer all these questions. <laughs> Well, Gaurav, I know, has got one question about what I'm doing with some of his Miocene stuff, but um, <laughs> I've been very busy recently, Gaurav, I'm sorry. <laughs> I understand, Bob, I understand, no problem, no problem, it's okay, <laughs> I really understand, but uh, really I'm very glad to see you again here, because it's a very nice platform to discuss all these things very easily. So, and... Uh, I'm really very happy because uh, we are working mainly on the, uh, nowadays we are working on the Shiva lakes and uh, maybe in the near future we will get many more fossil localities. Yay! Yeah, there is no dearth of fossils, you know. In Himalayas, there is no dearth of fossils. Only dearth is you need to have patience to find, you know. After medley, yeah, yeah. you know, you can't just sit and relax, you know, just, uh, and uh, I think... In Ladakh also, we got very, very interesting fossils over the years. Yes. And maybe it's just a matter of time. Uh, uh, we, actually, my interest at that time was finding water for the army and the civil population. And uh, wherever I, uh, I used to go, I used to uh, find time to collect fossils because that never died out, you know. And when, when I used to collect fossils, it was like, wow. But Again, the taxonomic point of uh, view, I was always always dependent on uh, BSIP for taxonomy. So taxonomy, uh, uh, I was good at, and then uh, and uh, doing the uh, entire story, we can do it together. Maybe with, with, I had very good relationship with uh, Avasti sir uh, and uh, the earlier fellows. Then I, then maybe now Gaurav and all, we can just continue with that. Let's see. Yes, so it, it was nice talking to you, Spicer, and uh, I hope uh, you also enjoyed giving the lecture, but uh, we would like to be in touch with you again and uh, uh, keep this, uh, and, the, and and you rightly mentioned that from the carboniferous uh, shales of, uh, uh, you were, they were able to, they are looking in Tibetan Plateau for uh, discovering oil. 
in some of the basins, you know. And I think uh, similar similar basins uh, if we can find in uh, uh, if we can find in in the Himalayan part, then it will be very good, because if uh, we can find something in uh, Tibetan part. I, 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 now I think that we don't have to compare anything what we get in Tibet with with the Himalayan parts because they are going to be entirely different identities, uh, and the and the Ladakh Batholith plays a major important role in dividing the two, and uh, there is no fun in finding any similarity. But but yes, contemporary vegetation grows everywhere in in in, in the same latitude or different. Uh, mm. So maybe we have those those basins here in the Himalayas, and then. Uh, uh, ONGC has been trying a lot hard to find a, a breakthrough in uh, getting one of the oil wells in, um, uh, in, in but they have not been su uh, success, but they have tried a lot. And uh, I have been uh, associated with one of their projects, which they drilled about five kilometers well in Kasoli. So, but I was finding water for them again, but uh, but I, I monitored the entire section because I, whenever I used to go, I used to see that entire five kilometers being drilled and then Lucky, they they were not that, that was not good luck. And then in Shivaliks also in Rame, uh, Ra, Ra, they were doing, doing doing great drilling works, but not much success. But I mm. think with with uh, with paleontological evidences coming up, more fossils being discovered and uh, better understanding of the basin, we may get some. Uh, not only about uh, it's not only about finding the collision, but how we can use the knowledge to explore. Um, Oil reserve, or explore oil in the Himalayas. You know, it is there, but now where it, where has it transported? Where has it moved in the basin because of the tectonics? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Might that, have that, leaked that, away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that is another question. We have uh, good oil fields in in the eastern part of uh, uh, India, but uh, uh, unfortunately, we are not getting any oil in the western part. Mm. So that is another challenge which we, I think, not only we face, but uh, ONGC is also facing, you know, and they're trying good. So I think, uh, uh, James, Peter, if you want to have some uh, questions you have, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Rana, I don't have any questions, but uh, one of my comments is what uh, Dr. Spicer has, uh, in his presentation, he's correlated things very well here. Uh, from our side, from the Indian side, I don't think we're doing isotope studies, you know, to the extent that is required. I, I don't know, really. I don't know if BSIP is doing it. But uh, this sort of thing is going to help, really. If you try to correlate your paleobotany or your fossils, your plant fossils, your spores, pollens or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. with the isotopes, yeah. Yeah, you all tell a different story, so you need to look at all the different aspects together if you can. I mean, BSIP now has moved away from just being paleobotany to be paleosciences, so uh, we have great expectations of a whole new array of techniques, um, including isotopes. So, Gurav, are you, are you going to start working on isotopes, or are you going to stick to leaves? No, they really don't stick to leaves, but they, I think they have a division which will work on the radioactivity. <laughs> Let him do what he... I think getting into... That will be another domain, you know. He has to... What, what do you say, Garo, about that? You know? uh, presently, I'm, I'm taking help from my colleague who is working on the carbon isotopes, but uh, we are working on the Eocene sediments, not on the Miocene. So... Maybe in the near future, we will have some good results. We will combine our uh, mega fossil result and the uh, carbon isotope results. And uh, very surprising, they are giving very similar results. So maybe in the near future, we will publish uh, some good papers combining the isotope and the mega fossil. But only I'm trying so, on the Eocene. So Eocene, you're working on uh, Eocene, you're working on the uh, leaves of... Or what you are working on, Yosin? Uh, I'm combining the results of isotopes and the mega fossil. And? And mega fossils. And mega fossils. So, Yosin, where have you found find some mega fossils? We have plenty of, uh, not, uh, uh, I think, uh, from Western India, we have uh, very good exposures of Yosin. No, but, but I, uh, I, I'll be interested, uh, you'll be interested to listen that we recently found very good. Uh, uh, 
fossilized wood, organic fossilized wood from the Eocene sediments. Oh, from where? From Sabatu Formation. Okay. These are very much uh, in... Uh, uh, these fossilized woods are in association with the oysters, you know. A huge chunk of oysters and we have this organic fossilized wood uh, with, in the same rock, you know. So maybe that is quite interesting and that is, I think... Uh, so quite interesting uh, findings yeah, we yeah. have, and we are going to display it in the museum which we are making. So that's that's the ongoing process. But yes, we will. We can um, once it is uh, done, then we can just um, share those specimens. And if you are interested, yeah, yeah. we can just work on that those specimens because they are going to be the first report from of Oligocene woods from uh, the western part of India. I think. Okay. Yeah. I, so I, think... I have to. I have to go. It's. Yeah. Um... Yes, I think uh, we have we have had a very interesting talk, and then uh, uh, we can just uh, uh, conclude this session. And uh, Dr. Kishan and Kant, uh, can you just? Yeah, of course. Uh, a very Sir, interesting session, sir. and uh, the discussion, of course, uh, added a lot to that. Uh, I hope that Dr. Spicer enjoyed a lot being here today, and uh, in future as well, we would love him to be a part of our discussions whenever. Steph is, uh, takes an initiative and uh, conducts more such workshops, more such uh, talks where people like Gaurav, people like uh, Dr. Vitesh himself, Robert Spicer, and other people who are here. Uh, I can see uh, James Peters is there and Rajiv Patnaik is also there. So whenever uh, this group of people who are interested in talking about fossils, talking about other things around and the various layers of this Tibetan part of the peninsula and other things are there. Those people who have extensive knowledge and research who have done about these things, whenever they want to share, uh, I hope that Dr. Ara would certainly arrange more such sessions under the banner of uh, Tethys. And uh, this has been a wonderful session. Thanks a lot all of you for being here today. And hopefully we'll be meeting soon again. Uh, thanks a lot once again, Dr. Robert Spicer. Oh, thank you. Thank and you. it's good to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good day. Let's say bye-bye. Bye-bye.